Hello and welcome to our live event tonight at 6 p.m. UK time. So it's time for our very first uh, online patient meeting today. I am glad to be back and I am also happy to have uh, Anna uh, with us today again. Hi, Anna. Hope you are good and well and uh, are ready for our next event. Hello. How are you? Good. Very happy to be here. Thank you. Happy to Hello. happy to hear that. Thank you so much for confirming. And please let us know that you can hear us loud and clear. We definitely want to make sure of that. And well, as always, let me just simply um, remind you that all our Stronger Together events have been brought to you thanks to our ambassadors and partners. You can see all of them right here. So as always, Thank you so much for your support. And uh, today, another topic to discuss. And as always, we will simply start with um, with um, introduction. And then, of course, we will go for your questions. So remember, you can type those questions in the chat section and we will uh, ask, uh, we will answer, I mean, Anna will answer them for you. And I just want to remind you that uh, Anna Galinda is, um, the medical director at Gravida, which is located in beautiful Barcelona in Spain. And she's here today to talk about reception of oocytes. This is our topic. And as I mentioned, she will start with her introduction, a few slides, and then uh, we will also um, answer the most common questions. And after that, as I've mentioned, it will be time for your questions. So don't miss your chance to ask a question so that um dr anna can help you out as a bit as well and uh, well that is it from me at least for now <laughs> and uh, well are you ready to begin then ready Excellent. so go ahead. let's go okay so first of all again thank you caroline thank you to the organization stronger together i it's not the first time i i i do this collaboration and i'm very happy to be here I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, reception of all sites, which is a topic that is uh, very well known. So I'm not going to repeat or get deep into um, very um, basic uh, topics that uh, most of you probably know. Just a, a few bird um, uh, view of uh, how did we get here, the, why the reception of all sites is so big right now, and uh, how uh, we, wor we work with this, because every country has the, their own regulation, and this is probably the little things that you're going to uh, feel different from one country to the other country, because technology, we have most of us, in different countries, the same one. But we work with different regulations, di different tiny concepts, different way of working. And this is why I'm here to explain our way. So uh, just to uh, put the, the picture in the frame, why uh, reception of our sites is so big. It's a, mostly a, a social phenomenon uh, that goes against the biological structure that we have as human. Women, as you see in this picture, we are built to have optimal fertility between maybe 18 or 20 to 30 something. That's the optimal age to have children or when we have our optimal uh, prognosis when we try to get pregnant. What happened in, in the last generations that women, we have gotten into professional fields, we have gone outside of our homes, that was the classical uh, social, social rule of, of uh, women. And this frame of having children has been delayed, delayed to, in Spain, for example, the first, the average age of the first kid is around 32, which is right in the middle of this threshold between optimal and starting to decline. So this phenomenon leads to women to uh, uh, 
want to be mothers later and sometimes nature uh, gives us some trouble, gives us some, some trouble in terms of quality of the eggs. Uh, sometimes we have a good quantity of eggs in our ovaries, but as far as we don't produce new ovaries, we have these ovaries remaining in our ovaries from the time we were little fetuses in our mother's bellies. These ovaries have uh, uh, more difficulties to mature and uh, they uh, commit mistakes that uh, leads the egg to give an embryo that it's going to uh, not become a kid, just be not uh, uh, able, just not implantation or a miscarriage. So uh, the, the limitation right now of fertility clinic is that we know how to work with eggs and sperm. We know how to take care of this sperm and egg, but we don't know how to improve their quality. So we are slaves of this quality in terms of giving prognosis of pregnancy. We are capable of diagnosing, but most of times we are not capable of improving. Just we have learned not to damage the embryos or the eggs or the sperm because we have better technology. We know better how to take care of them. We have better environments in our labs, better culture media, but we don't know how to fix them. And this um, frame uh, gave us uh, this scenario that how do can we offer uh, maternity in patients where the quality of the eggs or the amount of eggs or premature menopause um, don't uh, allow us to help them. So the only way right now nowadays is to get an egg from another person, another woman which is in the optimal frame of fertility and inseminate this egg with the partner or with bank sperm and putting this embryo generated in the maternal uterus. This is the way that we have found to give the opportunity of maternity in these cases. So in, in a way it's a failure of our resources because the ideal would be being able to fix the eggs of the the patient, but as far as we can't right now, in clinical, in medical, uh, in the clinic, uh, we have to uh, go for plan B, which is the the change of the egg. So, uh, as we use, you see here, donor oocyte with partners or bank sperm leads to the embryo, which is inserted in the uterus of the recipient. Uh, what are the requirements in Spain for egg donors? Uh, in Spain, the donation is voluntary, anonymous and altruistic, but they get a compensation for the medical treatment. Which can be a compensation that uh, lead, let or allow them to live out of this. It's a compensation for the effort they make. The age has to be 18 to 35. We check for family history, personal history, to decrease the risk factors of genetical, mainly uh, diseases in the offspring. Uh, they have to be in good physical and mental health. This means going through some tests to evaluate the pathology, mental pathology, mm -hmm. and exclude, of course, if there is. They have to have a sense of a sexual transmitted disease. And we check for um, security or we check for in order to minimize the genetical uh, risks in the offspring. This type of test that we perform to uh, minimize this risk in the offspring could be a little different between centers little different, mainly the same, but little di different how we, um, what we consider uh, 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 sickness that is not acceptable in a donor, 
not a sickness, a carrier of a sickness uh, that is um, no way we can't accept this donor. Which ones are the ones that say, okay, this is not as frequent in the population. So being carrier of this other one is not um, important. So this importance or the match between the donor and the partner depends on the clinic. And every clinic marks the frame of risks uh, in a general security frame. So it's performed the karyotype, the genetical testing, and uh, the number of offspring of each donor in Spain can be more than six. So these are the basics, the basic requirement for all site donors. What about the recipients? The recipients, what are the requirements? A medical, a medically valid, valid indication. This means uh, we need the patient has to have an indication either uh, precocious menopause, failed uh, IVF cycles before with low quality uh, of embryos, uh, either uh, very low ovarian reserve, even maternal age itself when it's very high or uh, could be a, an indication. Patients who are born without ovaries, patients that lost ovaries because of surgery, all these patients have a medical indication. And on the other hand, it has to be no contraindication for pregnancy. What does it mean? It doesn't have to be a sickness that could compromise the mother or the kid during pregnancy, such as a very severe high blood pressure, not controllable, or uh, some... Uh, thrombosis uh, uh, history mm, with uh, um, sicknesses that are residual or maybe an active cancer or sicknesses that compromise uh, the pregnancy. Uh, a normal uterus is required. Normal meaning a uterus that can, we suppose that can carry a pregnancy to the end or mostly to the end. There are some minor alterations of the uterus that are accepted because we think that this uterus is going to be able to carry this pregnancy, but mainly has to be a uterus that we consider um, not optimal, but um, uh, acceptably normal. Uh, the match uh, between uh, the donor and the recipient has to be, well, we, our law, requires to have to be according to phenotype. So matching the most we can phenotype of the recipient and the donor, we have to match with the new family. New family has to uh, be concordant with the phenotype of the donor. And also as far as they are, uh, those embryos coming from egg donation are embryos that have a high uh, implantation rate expected we recommend to transfer just one embryo. Uh, a few years before, we used to transfer mostly two embryos per transfer when we didn't have uh, this technology as developed and uh, when conditions in the lab didn't allow the embryos or maybe in some way were, were ideal. Nowadays, the ideal in the lab, the, the environment, the, the media culture is good enough to not to damage these embryos. So these embryos are a high potential of implantation. So with one at a time, we think it's safer. We don't want twins with all the risks of uh, preterm delivery, complications with high blood pressure during pregnancy, uh, complications with diabetes and others that uh, happen in twins, twin pregnancies. So one embryo recommended. And also to finish also with, with all this uh, explanation, just uh, explain to you the difference in between pregnancy risk and pregnancy risk. The pregnancy rates are high because these embryos have a high potential. So it's independent from maternal age, it's dependent on the donor characteristics. 
On the other hand, the pregnancy risks are dependent on maternal age and the risk factor of the mother. That's why we have to evaluate very closely the mother before going, going, getting into these treatments because these treatments are uh, have a high pr pregnancy uh, rate. So we have to make sure the mother and baby are going to be safe or at least we can't predict the future, but they have uh, in at the beginning a good prognosis so i'm going to finish with these basic ideas about uh, egg donation and thank you for your attention and answer the questions you have about it thank you excellent thank you so much dr anna for explaining all the details in regards to reception of all sites and now we will shortly go to those most common question uh, questions okay and after that it will be time for your questions so go ahead and type those in and uh, now let me start with uh sorry i just need to go back it's right here the first question will be can i choose the phenotype characteristics of my donor well uh that's a common question uh depends in theory the uh pregnancy rates don't depend on the phenotype so we could use any phenotype to create embryos and transfer it in a well prepared uterus and the the result would be in pregnancy so the phenotype characteristics are more dependent on the regulations on every country so in spain what's the the legal regulation the law says that uh, we have to choose the clinic has to is has to choose is mandatory to trying to find the most close phenotype type for from the donor to the family that this donor is going to go. Family meaning uh, the members of the family, but mainly to the recipient. Sometimes if we don't have the exact, the exact characteristics of the recipient, we look at, we look at the partner, uh, meaning uh, if uh, the recipient has brown eyes and the partner has green eyes, but I have a donor with is really similar in features, in color of skin, in other characteristics. And the only characteristic that is different is green eyes, but the, the partner of this patient is green-eyed. Sometimes we accept these little, little changes of phenotype. But mostly in Spain, it has to be a phenotype that is the most close to the recipient. We can't choose really the phenotype of the donor. Perfect. Thank you so much for answering that uh, question. And next one is, uh, what can I know about my donor? This is another typical topic that uh, it's very, it's slightly different in different standards. In Spain, the law regulation says uh, it has to be anonymous. But what does it mean anonymous? It means that we can't give any characteristics of the donor. It means that we can give everything except the name and the address. This is a, a big frame of options from everything except the name and the address or nothing at all. So every center de defines what's the, the limits that are going to put or the way they wanna work. So in our center, in, uh, we decided in our ethical committees and we decided to give the, the recipients the phenotype characteristics. This means like, uh, sorry, that means color of skin, color of uh, hair, color of eyes, general features, height and weight, complexion and blood group. This is the characteristics that the recipients can know about the donor in our center. There's other centers that are more restrictive. There are other centers that are more open to give more information. Excellent. Thank you so much again for explaining this to us, uh, as definitely every patient 
surgeon that is looking for for a clinic, I guess they always need to ask specific clinic what sort of information they get they can find out. This is definitely important. Thank and you. also I forgot the age. Also the age of the egg is very important. So we give this also. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, okay, and so what are the genetical security tests of the donor carrier map? Okay, another issue that it's pretty slightly different in other center in all the centers. Uh, we try to minimize the genetical risk in the offspring. This is a global idea, but we have to make uh, specific points about it. How do we work? Uh, with uh, all these uh, huge uh, amount of options that we have. There's, um, we work with carrier maps or maps of genes. The problem with uh, this genetical risk is not, there's some, there's the types of genetical sicknesses, the dominant ones, that means that we have two copies of, of the genotype, one coming from our mother, one coming from our father. So these two copies are the same, but complementary. The, if there's a sickness or mutation in a gene which is dominant, it means that e either if maternal uh, copy or paternal copy has the copy that is alterated, it's uh, the wrong copy, the individual the other copy is not going to be able to compensate this uh, problem, so the individual will be sick. These sicknesses are not a worry to us because we see the sickness. If the donor is a carrier of a dominant uh, genetical problem, we see it. It's going to be in her med medical history, so it doesn't worry us so much because most of them, they show up. What's the problem? The problem is when we have this, uh, what's, uh, the, it's not dominant, it's uh, um, recessive. The recessive sicknesses mean we have two copies. If there's one copy which is wrong and one copy that it's right, the right copy compensates the wrong copy. So the sickness doesn't appear. It's a healthy person carrying a sickness. The problem comes if the exact mutation comes from the mother and from the father. So we have wrong and wrong, no right to compensate. These are the recessive sicknesses. What worries us is what, what's going to happen if we have a donor carrying a sickness and the partner of the recipient is carrier of the same sickness. That would be a problem because a uh, quarter of the offspring, 25%, would be sick uh, kids. So this is what we want to avoid. Uh, this is, uh, we are carriers of many, many, uh, these little mutations that the other copy compensates. So all of us are carriers of these mutations. The problem with uh, the mutations that are very, very um, low in, uh, in in the population, very low frequency in the population, it's not a problem because it's very, very rare that the same sickness of these rare sicknesses are going to be the same in the donor and in the uh, partner or in the other donor of sperm. The problem comes from sicknesses that are pretty uh, common in the population, such as uh, cystic fibrosis, what's called the mucoviscidos, which in our area is 4% of the population. It comes out with a thalassemia that it's in our population could be more or less around 25, from 5 to 25%, depending on the areas. These are the problematic sicknesses because uh, we have a pretty high chance or not high, but um, accept high enough to be worried that maybe the donor and the partner of this recipient could be carriers of these sicknesses that are prevalent in the population. So there's two types of uh, confronting this, saying, okay, 
we're going to perform in all the donors and all the partners of uh, uh, of these uh, treatments this um, test called carrier map the carrier map is a list of 300 sicknesses from the most frequent to the lowest frequent that are mapped in the donor and in the partner of the recipient or the sperm donor and we match the results we match the result meaning we are not looking for a perfect genotype that don't have mutation we are looking for risk of coincidence of the same same sickness between donor and the partner uh, this is one approach what this means that we decrease a lot the risk of uh, sickness because we are um, matching these uh, these um, risks but we don't filter for carriers so uh, maybe the offspring is going to have this carrier of uh, cystic fibrosis that is also common in the population and maybe we'll have to counsel this kid to go for cystic uh, fibrosis counseling when they want to have children but usually this information is not given so what we decided is to go 50 50. we uh, perform this carrier map excluding the donors for the most uh, common sickness in the population such as cystic fibrosis uh, thalassemia uh, 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 it's a, a type of paralysis in the kids called uh, spine atrophy and also uh, 16 sicknesses that are located in chromosome X. We, we test these tests on the donors and if they are positive, we give them counseling and we don't accept these donors as donors in our center. So we have this common sickness excluded and then the carrier map is optional for patients, for the recipients. So if the the recipient the problem with carrier maps are is that are expensive so if they want to check double check other uh, sicknesses that are low prevalence in the population they have the option to do it if not we have the basic panel covered so we have the most common sickness in the population excluded so we are good with this uh with this 50 50 so we don't create carriers of mucabicidas, for example, but uh, we can also get more, uh, increase the test if the patient wants to. Perfect. Thank you so much for the detailed uh, answer to this uh, very important question indeed um next question is so what are the tests performed on the donor related to COVID 19. okay this is another thing it's new um, yes. COVID has been a, a hit in all the world so we also we stopped working we are now restarting we already started cycles but the key point is we don't want uh, as as far as COVID, the, the good thing about the, the COVID is that it's a very selective respiratory uh, virus. So it likes a lot the lungs. It doesn't like the uh, reproductive tract. So it doesn't have really um, this uh, philia for uh, going to the tract. There's been some, some samples of sperm uh, that uh, it's, it's been found in sperm some mm, specific molecules related to COVID, but we don't know if it's manipulation or if it's real that COVID can go through uh, sperm. We never found it in follicular uh, fluid, so in the egg uh, surrounding fluid, we haven't found it yet or not been reported as far as I know. So the good thing about it is, not, is that it's not uh, a virus that really likes the genital tract. Uh, the bad thing about it is that it's very common, so we don't want the donors 
to be donating when they are active uh, uh, in these uh, signals. So what do we do? So we test for them when they start treatment. We test for them for symptoms all the time when they come to the clinic for fever, for cough, for headache, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They fill up every time that uh, come to the clinic. That they, they come very often. So we test them for uh, symptoms and we test direct virus in the throat and in the nose, the PCR, when they start treatment and when they are about to go for the pickup. So the, we make sure that we they didn't go uh, through treatment with a positive test, direct positive test for COVID. Uh, in this, if they were positive for COVID, we wouldn't use these eggs. We, would, we wouldn't uh, finish the treatment. So that's the test that nowadays we are we are also performing. As uh, of, of course, as you see, I'm with these protections, and in the clinic, there's uh, several um, new rules for patients not to be combined in the same uh, waiting room. We uh, disinfect all all the spaces, so we try not to be. Uh, um, carriers ourselves of these signals. We perform testing ourselves. So we try for the COVID to be outside of the clinic, which is pretty hard. Yes, indeed. But, uh, well, we definitely need to uh, simply um, just follow it <laughs> for now, at least, yes, and hope mm -hmm. that it uh, soon it will be a bit better as well. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you so much once again for answering that uh, question. Next one is, uh, are fresh also is the same as frozen ones? Uh, that's a tough question uh, because uh, in terms of uh, quality of the embryos, uh, that uh, are created from fresh or from frozen oocyte, this quality of the embryos and the capacity of these embryos to implant and to give birth are the same, are equal. But the only thing with frozen, and as far as we have observed, is they have a really good uh, survival rate when we defrost them, but sometimes we you lose, there's little steps in the middle that could lose some eggs. So when we compare groups of fresh and frozen, the implantation rate and the pregnancy rate are the same, exactly the same. The only thing is that maybe, maybe you need a, one more or two more eggs to be equivalent in number of embryos obtained of this group of eggs because of this uh, middle steps uh, uh, that the frozen go through and the fresh don't. So there's slight different different differences, but not that much. Mm, we work with either with fresh with, or with frozen, depending on the timings, the phenotype of the of of the recipient. Uh, for example, with usual phenotypes like mine, that I'm Mediterranean brown. Uh, here, like Mediterranean skin, uh, it's the most common phenotype in our area. So we still have this uh, protocol to use fresh oocytes and take this more complicated treatment to give the most rendibility to treatment, not on pregnancy uh, rates, but in number of embryos, maybe one embryo more. Uh, in rare phenotypes, such as, for example, uh, very light skin, red hair, and green eyes. These phenotypes are more, less uh, common in our population, so sometimes they, they don't uh, come in time, at the same time, the donor wanting to donate and the recipient, the recipient wanting to receive. So in these cases, we work with frozen oocyte, with uh, phenotypes that are not so usual. So we are happy working with fresh and with frozen. The only thing is a little slight differences. 
Perfect. Thank you so much once again for answering that question. Next one is, uh, can a woman without menstruation get pregnant with donor oocytes? Well, that's, uh, the answer is uh, absolutely yes. So egg donation doesn't, uh, doesn't depend on having uh, ovaries or having menstruation, which is the functional part of the uterus. As far as the women have uterus, we and normal uterus, even though this uterus haven't been working for a long time, we can medically wake this uh, uterus up and create uh, menstruation if the endometrium is not damaged because of surgeries or something that happened. We can create menstruations and create this receptivity that we need to uh, be able to uh, give the opportunity of getting pregnant. So uh, women that has uterus and didn't have a menstruation for a long time, if they have the other, uh, the other characteristics favorable, favorable, we can really do the treatment with a good pregnancy rate. And thank you so much once again for explaining this. Um, next question is here. So is it important for the blood group of the donor to be the same as the recipient mothers? Well, the blood group is something that it's usually required by our recipients. I want the same blood group because I want to be able to donate blood uh, to my kid when it's older, if something happens. And this is a topic that it's not exactly, you know, like mathematics. The women, we, as women, as far as we are ready to get pregnant with uh, embryos that naturally that are combination of us and our partner, we are capable of accepting pregnancies from all blood groups. The, ex the blood group, it has two parts the main blood group, which is AV and zero or combinations, and the RH. The only problem that could we could have is in a woman with RH negative that had before a pregnancy with a fetus RH positive and didn't have the vaccines to neutralize the reaction. The RH negative mother when it's pregnant with her RH positive kid, could create these antibodies. The body learns that something, this RH positive that the mother doesn't have, uh, creates a reaction that can be stopped with uh, little vaccines that are performed during the pregnancy. If these vaccines are not given to the mother and during pregnancy and when she delivers, the next pregnancy could be a problem if she carried a blood group RH positive. This is the only case when medically we give a negative donor if, if the partner is negative, because if the partner is positive, we have the risk of positive in the partner. So uh, it's kind of tricky. But if the partner is negative and the mother is negative, the recipient is negative, and she has a previous man pregnancy with problems with her age, is the only case that we give, we have, we need to give medically an RH negative. In the other cases, we could combine. Another thing is the social issue. There are some patients that don't want to, are planning on not telling the kid that it's from an egg donation, and they're worried about uh, a blood group, and when the kid is older, uh, the kid can say, well, I'm B. What's for your blood group, mom? And mom is A. And what's your blood group, uh, pop? And the father is zero. And the kids have studied the combinations and is in the, is in this, at school and says, well, from A and zero, there's no B here. What happened here? And uh, this could be a problem social problem or intra-family problem. In um, partners or patients that are planning on explaining to the kids and not having this problem of hiding something shouldn't be a problem. 
Excellent. Thank you. Once again for answering this question. Now it is uh, the last question when it comes to those most common ones and we will go for your questions and there are quite a few questions ready as well. And the question is, so given that in egg donation the genes are external, what does the recipient mother bring to the creation of her child? Well, this is a, a complicated question, but um, uh, that's what it's called epigenetics. So in the last decade, we have learned a lot about uh, pregnancies and expression of the genes. And one part is we, we it's because we've seen these kids coming from egg donation. Uh, I remember when I was younger, but a long time ago, when I started with these cycles and the mothers and the families from egg donation came to our clinic and with the, with the kids already grown up and to say hello and show us the family, I used to think, well, we did a really good job. This kid looks exactly like the mother and the father, specifically like the mother. And, and it was an egg donation. And uh, I remember these thoughts because lately we've learned that uh, the individual is genetics and epigenetics. A genetics is the book where it's written all the information in, of our genes, the basic information. This um, writing has letters and these letters are in words and these words are the genes. But the way that the, these words are written by the recipient, which is the mother, the recipient and the environment of these genes could activate some genes and not activate other genes. So this means that the environment conditions the expression of these genes. So this means that the mother also uh, builds up the baby, gives these bricks, these proteins that create the baby, and they are built in some in the maternal way, reading an, an external genotype, but the way of the mother. So it's a mixture of genetics and epigenetics, that it's very strong, this epigenetic condition, emotional issues, risk factors for the future, even for having cholesterol, even some phenotypical expressions that could go to the mothers, uh, the mother that uh, is pregnant. So we have a, a lot to learn about epigenetics, but it's there. And it's not that the mother that uh, uh, carries the pregnancy don't do anything, they do a lot. So more to learn still about epigenetics nowadays. Excellent. Thank you so much for clarifying. This is definitely quite an important question for lots of patients. So huge thank you for explaining as well. And now it is time for uh, your questions. So as I mentioned, there are plenty uh, here as well. And Dr. Anna, are you ready for them? Ready. Let's go. Excellent. Thank you. So the first question is right here. What are the most significant advantages, disadvantages of the procedure in Spain compared to the UK and US? Well, <laughs> that's a tricky question. Uh, I think that um, technology in main of the labs in Spain, UK and US is mostly the same in big labs. The difference is the, uh, the law in different places and also the interpretation or the, the way to use this technology. So, for example, in Spain, we have this uh, anonymous donation. We have a lot of donors, but they're all anonymous. In UK and US, you can know about uh, ID either later or uh, at the moment that's uh, depending on the, the the area where you go for so we can it's it's more like well in us you can choose even your donor you can choose level of education you can choose uh, social issues and also if uh, ethically you have these um, 
conviction that the right of the kid is to know the origins and even to have the opportunity to meet the donor, maybe UK and US would be better scenarios compared with Spain. Also, there's uh, the interpretation of uh, or the way that we use technology. For example, uh, in Spain, uh, we tend the IVFs, we use PGD, which is the diagnosis of the, uh, the chromosomes of the embryos to be able to choose exactly the one that is uh, the, the one that has the most uh, potential to give the baby, so per transfer has the most uh, capacity to implant and give a, a healthy child, which is the PGT. Uh, we have this technology in Spain, but usually in egg donation, due to the big um, spend that represents to add more and more techniques, it's not, we have the, the, the option to do it, but it's not usually performed. For example, in US, even in egg donation cycle, they perform this uh, selection of the embryos because they want per transfer the most, the most uh, uh, capacity of implantation. So, uh, but also it's more expensive. So it's uh, like, I think when you decide to go to one country, and, and go for treatment, uh, you have to think what's your wrong and your right, what's your advantage or disadvantage. If you are, so, if you are convinced that you want, you need to know uh, more information about donor or it's important for you to know more things about donor, don't, go, don't come to Spain because it's not the right place. Uh, if uh, in terms of Quality of the labs, we are equivalent. So if you want uh, maybe a slower budget with a good quality, uh, also maybe Spain is, a, is an option. Depends on your rights and your wrongs and the social, the couple uh, opinions or priorities and also the budget that you have. Perfect. Thank you so much for explaining all the details on that matter. And uh, now let's go to the next question that we have. So is it possible to have more of my husband DNA than the donor? More of my husband. Uh, well, I don't really understand uh, the question because the embryo is uh, is created by half and half, so half of the uh, information is going to be the donors, the egg information, and half is going to be the, your husband. What this means that the embryo is uh, has this written book, and you are going to put the reading. So. It's maybe third, third and third, uh, what happens really. As far as I know, there's no way to uh, increase the expression of DNA of the husband's part. All right, thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, next question is right here as well. So you mentioned the recipient needing a normal uterus. Would fibroids or endometriosis cause a problem? Well, fibroids are not a problem. De well, are a problem depending where they are located. Fi we know that the, the fibroids is the most difficult evaluation that we have uh, in well, I'm talking about me. I have really uh, big trouble because there's opinions in all the ways about fibroids. What we know, it's a fibroid that pops in the uterus that makes an imprint inside of the uterus, decreases the implantation rate. So as far as we can, these fibroids that, that are producing inside of the uterus, we, uh, we recommend strongly to remove if possible and if they have a uh, uh, size that don't compromise the structure or the don't compromise 
that the intervention is going to have a risk of losing most of the uterus. If they have a size that the surgeon uh, says, okay, I can remove this fibroid with no big damage of the uterus expected, we recommend to uh, remove this type of the fibroids. The other type of fibroids, uh, talking about the ones that are inside of the wall of the uterus, these are called inter intramural fibroids. These are a big discuss because they are little balls that are in this wall that has to be really smooth and clean, and they uh, interfere in the contractility of the uterus. They, they have some in interferation that gives a little less implantation rates, but, but most of times are not as important as to be a contraindication for, uh, for pregnancy. The fibroids that are these little balls outside of the uterus, the problem is lower except if they are huge and they have a big occupation of the abdominal area. This means that when the uterus is going to be growing, it, there's going to be a compromise of space and maybe these ones are the ones that are don't uh, represent that high risk of uh, losing the uterus in the surgery. So these ones that are big are, con uh, are considered to be removable. The other, on the other hand, these are, um, the, the options are big and the recommendations are very variable between specialists, sometimes with a, uh, a, a limit size, which is five centimeters of a fibroid. Some specialists say, no way you have to remove this. And some specialists say, well, okay, leave it. So it's kind of tricky. If we are talking about the uterus that has been, uh, has many, many fibroids removed several times with a lot of scars in the uterus and they still have keep uh, growing more fibroids, sometimes these uterus are not capable of holding a pregnancy because they have so many scars, so many uh, fibroids that are, is, are a high risk for this pregnancy. Just in limit cases, in, in very high percentage of uh, fibroids, it could be a problem because removing again these fibroids is uh, taking out little pieces of uterus. Sometimes you don't have uterus remaining when you keep in this heavy fibroid uterus. So this is all about uterus. Endometriosis is another key, uh, tricky um, indication because endometriosis uh, is a, a, a tissue that uh, is similar to the endometrium, the tissue that is inside of the uterus, but being outside of the uterus, in the ovaries, in the inside of the abdomen. This creates lots of scars around, creates a, a, a little mess, depending on the, the, the stadium of the endometriosis. We know that when there's a, a, a severe endometriosis, this um, scar tissue, this uh, in, inflammation status of uh, the belly creates a, a a lower capacity of this uterus to implant, but not new. What's the key point nowadays is the adenomyosis, which is a vascular like lakes inside uh, and in the limit of the endometrium and the myometrium. This gives us a lot of trouble because it's kind of a, a, a sickness that is similar to endometriosis, but right inside of the uterus so it's very difficult to remove and they're giving uh, some trouble so dealing with uh, adenomyosis now it's a uh, very complicated but we are dealing with it and we are getting pregnant people with adenomyosis with, when it's not really really severe so usually is a great of grace it's not black or white is uh, evaluating uh, pros and cons all right, excellent. Thank you so much for your question and your thorough answer to this as well. And so, well, next question is up. You mentioned that the donor can have no more than six babies born from their eggs, presumably excluding children of their own. Is the number of babies born by the donor made known for the recipient? 
you we usually we don't give this information there's a now running from the last start the last year the national obligated report of these babies to the the the, the the government so the government keeps track on these uh, donations and make sure that there's no more than six why because of the not known consanguinity so if the possibility when we talk about international like donation is less a problem but it could be a problem that uh, two persons coming from the same egg or same donor um, could uh, get together and um, try to have children. In this case of consanguinity, the risk is of this, as we talked before, this res recessive sickness in the same family, it's the same pattern of sicknesses. This means that uh, is, if we talk about uh, risk of sickness congenital sickness if two cousins or two relatives get together to have children the pattern of sickness it's going to be similar so the risk of the coincidence is going to be higher so in these cases we should perform these carrier maps to make sure that nothing is uh, there's no risk so to avoid this possibility or minimize this possibility, there was a calculation for all the population in Spain uh, that was statistics performed, and uh, they came out of conclusion that six is the number of offspring that we can accept to minimize this point. So for the moment, we don't really tell the recipient uh, how many offspring is uh, out of these eggs, but we control this with these regulations. Excellent. Once again, thank you so much for answering this question. Next question is uh, here. My TSH is 3.24. What do you recommend to bring it down before IVF with donor eggs? Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, the thyroid function is another tricky issue. You are coming up with all the tricky issues in, uh, in egg reception. So it's another tricky issue because there's believers and not believers. So I'm a believer of thyroid. I think or I'm convinced that the function of the thyroid is very important in the uh, capacity of getting pregnant and also in the early development of this embryo. So thyroid has to be ready to increase the production to give uh, this hormone, the thyroid, the thyroid, the thyroid T4, which is the thyroidal uh, hormone, to the baby and to the mother. Uh, when there's TSH, TSH is the hormone that stimulates the thyroid, that gives the order to the thyroid to produce this T4, which is the hormone of thyroid. Meaning that if the body has to give a big, big uh, signal of TSH, means the thyroid is a little, a little deaf. The thyroid has to, we have to yell at the thyroid, then work and the thyroid works well but it needs more stim uh, stimulation from the own body this type of thyroid that in usual life there's no problem we give them more the body gives the thyroid more uh, stimulation and the uh, thyroid produces normal rates of t4 it's not a problem but when we put these thyroids in stress meaning we need more production of T4 for me and I want to get pregnant. So for my baby, some of these thyroids, not all of them, they can't give this increase of production. As far as what we don't know really, which ones, uh, which uh, situations are going to, which type of thyroid is going to give us enough or not, we are based on TSH. When TSH is less than 2 or 2.5, we consider that the thyroid is going to be ready to increase this production. When the, the TSH is over 2.5, even being normal, because until 
it's over four or five, we don't consider that this person could have a problem of production for normal life, we recommend to supplement a little bit, especially when there's antibodies, anti-thyroid, which we always test when there's a TSH over 2.5. But I, uh, I repeat, it's because I'm a thyroid believer. There's other thyroid not believers that think that the thyroid is going to put up with this production and they don't treat unless it's over 3.5 or 4. Excellent. Thank you so much for answering this question. There are two questions left, at least for now. So we will be slowly finishing. So this is like the final call for your questions. If you have any left, go ahead and type those in right now. And the question is right here. So what should the surrogate be taking um, to, um, and not taking regarding vitamins in their pregnancy? I've also heard that taking organic flaxseed oil during during a pregnancy can bring on, oh, sorry, during, it can bring on a miscarriage. What is your view? And actually there is another question from the same patient. So what should the donor be taking prior to donation? How many months before? Well, this is uh, another tricky issue because uh, we know that uh, style of life, and also uh, diet and uh, sports, type of element of uh, living, toxics, uh, they all, all give something on, uh, represent something on reproductive track. So uh, there's a, a lot of products that uh, the flaxseed oil or other products that have been named in the list of uh, risk of miscarriage. But uh, in my opinion, it, it, we need more knowledge about them because we, in diet, in supplements, we don't really know. A few years ago, there was um, vitamin D was almost forbidden in pregnancy. Right now we know that vitamin D is important. So, uh, we need to know more. There's just few papers about it. And really what I would say is as far as epigen in surrogate, as far as epigenetics is so important, it's, it's good to have a supplement, but a regular supplement of vitamins for pregnancy and make sure that the style of life is healthy. In donors, we recommend style of life. We give them a list of uh, diet that they should uh, go through. Of course, they're young. They say yes, but they are pretty healthy, all of them. We don't let donors with overweight going through treatment because of the risk inside of the treatment for them and also the style of life. And we try to make some little uh, ways to go for them, but it's it's a tricky way because uh, I, it's uh, we can't be with them 24 hours a day. So that's my opinion. We have a lot to know about diet and style of life yet. All right, thank you so much for explaining this as well. And uh, one more question has uh, shown up right here. So let's have a look. It looks like it is our last one. So what's your take on levothyroxine for thyroid? Well, the levothyroxine is the, 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 the copy of T4, so which is the hormone that thyroids produce. So it's the molecule that we usually use to help the thyroid in these patients that we think that the thyroid is not going to give, uh, to give or to sustain this increase of production that pregnancy or, or treatments um, require. So uh, the dosage of levothyroxine depends on TSH, depends if uh, the, it's over five, if it's less, depends on the weight of the patient, depends also in the style of life, depends on the diet. So it's very variable in different, different ways. All so right. it's definitely the molecule that it's used. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Excellent. Thank you so much. And actually, there is a follow up uh, also on this uh, topic. So and does antithyroid antibodies with normal thyroid function has an implication on low account on a young person? Uh, I personally don't think so. Uh, the anti uh, thyroid antibodies, um, in theory, just uh, have a target, which is the thyroid. So in these patients with antibodies positive in a normal thyroid function, what we do is a close follow-up of the function of the thyroid when we go through treatment. On the other hand, if you if a patient has an autoantibodies, also could have the tendency to have also anti ovarian antibodies, which are not always, it's just sometimes. So it's not that the antithyroid antibodies go to the ovary and decrease the ovarian reserve, is that some patients with antithyroid antibodies could have also another anti, uh, autoimmunity, I'm sorry because these are tricky words for me, uh, would have this uh, tendency to antibodies at who could lead uh, for the, the patient to go for a, a precautious low ovarian uh, reserve. But it's, it's not a direct effect, it's just the way the person is and the antibodies that she develops. All right, excellent. Thank you so much again for answering the question. One more showed up, so I guess we can uh, answer this as well. So which grade of embryos should be transferred and which grade of embryos not should well, be transferred? That's a, a tricky <laughs> question again. What All the tricky very questions. Very tricky. Uh, well, uh, you should know, uh, that's my view, that we are capable of taking care of the embryos, but we are still weak in evaluating the embryos just looking at them. Uh, this means that we really uh, feed them and take care of them, but uh, the only way nowadays that we have to um, grade them is by their aspect, their characteristics. We can take a look in, in some points of the development, we can look at them continuously, so with, a, with the embryoscope or the other time lapse and see what's the uh, really the, the intermediate steps of these embryos, but sometimes embryos lie. So, meaning that we grade the embryos from, there's different types uh, in our clinic, for example, there's other types of uh, grades of the embryos, but we uh, grade the embryos from A to D, meaning A is the excellent, B is the good, pretty good, C is, well, it's the threshold, it's like so-so, and D is not adequate. So when there are embryos, they, they three, well, day two, day three, they only have one letter, which is A, V, or C, depending on the fragmentation, depending on the size of the cells, depending on how they divide, when they divide it, etc. So, when they get to blastocyst stage, which is day five or day six, they have two letters in our grade, which is what one is the trophoectoderm, which is going to lead to the placenta and the, the membranes and the inner cell air mass, which is going to lead to the embryo. And we grade the two areas separate. The, um, the, the, the fetus area, inner cell, it's going to be A, B, C, or D. And uh, trophoectoderm is going to be also A, B, C, or D. In our clinic, what do we transfer? Combinations of A and B. We only transfer C in fresh cycles when there's nothing else. When we don't have anything else, and as far as the embryo is alive, we transfer a C embryo or a combination with C. When in terms of freezing the embryo, when we ask this, this uh, 
characteristics of the embryos give us the idea of how is the embryo, the vitality of the embryo. But uh, also the nice looking embryos are the ones that have more probability to have a correct number of chromosomes, but not all the times. They lie sometimes. For example, Down syndrome embryos are beautiful, are gorgeous embryos, and they are a trisomy 21. So sometimes they lie. But in terms of vitality or the, the, the capacity, metabolic capacity of this embryo, we, we in our clinic freeze embryos from combinations only A or B because we know that we are asking to these embryos to uh, an extra effort, which is freezing them and the, of the effort to survive in good conditions after defrosting. So as far as we are asking to these embryos to do more stuff, uh, Cs are not really good doing this. So uh, just rarely we freeze C, uh, stable, C level uh, or great embryos. We transfer sometimes this C when there's nothing else. All right, perfect. Again, thank you so much for your explanation to the grading of embryos. And uh, in the meantime, one more question showed up, so I guess we can still answer. However, this is our last one, okay? <laughs> oh, good. Go ahead. Thank you. So at what moment should patients start taking progesterone and what amount? Another tricky one. Uh, progesterone uh, marks the implantation window. And this is another subject that it's very, uh, well, it's it's a nowadays uh, subject, no? What's, uh, where or when the implantation window opens. The meaning, uh, we know that the endometrium is receptive for implantation just maybe 12 to 24 hours at the most, maybe 12. So this frame of time is when we have to transfer the embryo. Usually this frame opens between the five and six of development of the embryo, which is the day that naturally the embryo will fall down from the tubes. And it's when we want to transfer a blastocyst stage embryo or uh day three counting that the when this day three is going to get to blastocyst stage is going to be day five or six of uh of progesterone so in recipients what do we do we count the fifth five days five complete days of progesterone in our center there are some patients that have this frame uh in other uh, uh it's it's uh, moved moved uh, forward or backward. This means that these specific patients have trouble in planting. And in these patients that we perform these uh, tests, which are called the receptivity tests for endometrium, in these specific patients, we try to know which is the, uh, the perfect timing for the, their own window of uh, implantation. Sometimes it's seven days, sometimes it's four days for a blastocyst stage. So in these specific patients where, where we perform the, uh, the, implant, the, the receptivity um, test, we move this frame. But usually it's on day five full, five full days of progesterone for blastocyst, not for day three. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much for answering all the questions. It is, um, that was our last question. So, um, Dr. Anna, thank you so much. Once again, you've been brilliant. That was a really interesting session. And thank you to all of you for joining us today and uh, for your questions as well. <laughs> I do believe that it was very useful for you. And well, Dr. Anna, uh, just want you to see that there are some <laughs> thank yous from the patients as well. So once again, huge thank you. Uh, is there anything you would like to add? Well, just thank you, everybody this time that's connected. Thank you for 
you to you Caroline to help me in this in all the ways that you have helped me before and it's always a pleasure also, and also <laughs> just saying we are on we are with all our um, illusions and with with our well doing trying to do our best working here uh, we hope that uh, 1st of July, the, the borders are going to be open, so we are going to be able to, to get uh, these patients that are waiting for us outside and just doing our best all the time. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much once again. And I just want to remind everyone that, of course, this has been recorded. You will be able to find the recording very, very soon on our site, myavfenses.com, but also on YouTube channel. And, uh, well, I definitely encourage everyone to simply follow us on our Facebook or Instagram. And that way you will know when new event is coming up. And as you know, there is another one coming up at 8 p.m. UK time. So I hope you are able to join us as well as we will have another interesting topic to discuss and another guest here as well once more dr anna huge thank you <laughs> and uh, have a lovely and relaxing evening and uh, well take care everyone hope to see you very very soon dr anna as well <laughs> thank you bye bye